Hello, and today I'm going to go through the process for installing a CPU AuthFS all in one server using Ninefront. This will be a server that is installed from scratch and is configured to accept connections from low privilege users across a network. So, to start off, we're going to do a standard Ninefront install. The host owner is going to be Glenda, and we're booting off SD, D0, DCD-ROM to get started. You can take the defaults, accept the mouse port here, and we are greeted by the standard Rio landing screen with a Rio start. We're going to start the installation with int start. We're going to use HJFS. This is a smaller disk, and HJFS will permit us to take up less space with regular dumps, but you could have regular dumps if you configured cron to do so. Partition the disk. We're going to partition SDC0, the hard disk. We're going to use MBR to lower complexity. Accept the defaults. W to write. Q to quit. Prep disk. Same Python 9 partition we just made. Right quit. We're going to mount the file system. Accept the default. We're going to set the cache size. This is the size of the file system that's cached in memory until it's written back to the disk. We're going to remit, which initializes everything. We're going to configure the distribution. We're going to use the local distribution on the ISO. We're going to use an automatic DHCP configuration. This will take a second while it talks with the DHCP server. Mount the distribution. Accept defaults, and it'll copy the distribution. This is the most time consuming step as the proto file is processed and unpacked, unpacking the ISO onto the disk.
Now that the distribution has finished copying, we are going to set up our network database or NDB. We're going to set a sysname. We should call our system something fun. I'm going to take the name uh, some host. We're going to set our time zone, US Pacific for me. Set up boot setup. Set the defaults. We are going to install the Plan 9 master boot record. We are going to mark the Plan 9 partition active. Finish. And now we need to remove the ISO. I'll reset the system one more time. And this time we should be booting off of the MBR bootloader. We see SDC0, T hard disk, and we accept the default. We are booting as Glenda, the host owner. This can be changed. At install, you need to use Glenda to boot the ISO and install, but you can change the host owner later if you really want. Now we have a regular Plan 9 terminal. If no more configuration was done, we could connect to another system. However, we want to be a system connected to, so we're going to do this a little differently. To start, we're going to edit the plan9.ini file used to bootload the system. This is 9fat. 9fs9fat will mount this at slash n slash 9fat. We're going to make a backup of our plan9.ini just to be safe. We're going to edit our plan9.ini. We are going to need our IP address for this step, so let's find that real quick. We're going to invoke the DHCP server. And then we're going to check our IP address and setup. We can see that our IP is 10.0.2.15, and there's other information that could be useful here. We're going to take that IP address, put it in our snarf buffer, and import the snarf buffer from Rio into SAM. We're going to set some information here. You could use host names. I'm just going to use IP addresses in case some resolution fails. So first things first, we're going to set the boot args as a default using no boot prompt. And this will initially Let's stash our IP address away over here, 10.0.15. And we're going to take our boot args. And we're going to use the HJFS listening arguments. These can be found in the FQA. Dash A capital will use authentication, and dash A lower will set our dial string to listen on, or announce string. 564 is the default for Plan 9 file servers. We're going to set the default host owner. This user is set to Glenda, who is, will be our host owner. And we're going to set auth, and this will be our IP address down below. Just to be safe, let's add some other values. We don't need to set FS. We're going to set our auth DOM. We're going to make our auth DOM somewhere. And we're going to set the service when we reboot to be a CPU server. This will make the CPU server boot in CPU mode as opposed to a terminal. We are done with the bootloader for now. Now we are going to set up the auth server itself. First things first, we need to write to NVRAM or non volatile RAM. The host owner name, and password key. To do this, we're going to invoke auth wr key, or auth write key. You notice there's nothing there now, and the auth ID will be the host owner's name, in this case, Glenda. The auth domain is going to be somewhere, as I specified somewhere else. The capital letter is not significant, but sets it apart from other values. 
we're going to set the potential future Glenda sex store password. And now we set Glenda's actual password. Now that the AuthWR key has been written to disk, we are going to start KeyFS. KeyFS needs to be loaded every time that you are going to modify a user's key. So we're going to do auth change user on Glenda. This will tell the auth server the password we put in above. This has to match the password you put into NVRAM. And these values that follow are not particularly significant for configuration and can be whatever you want. The post ID should be Glenda. The full name, Glenda, maybe with a smiley face. Just to be safe, I'm going to invoke auth enable on Glenda. Now we have Glenda installed in the auth server. We are now going to configure the network database. In slash lib slash ndb, there is a file called local. We are going to edit that. You'll see that our system, some host, is right here and with an Ethernet tuple attached. We are going to add some extra information here. We're going to add the auth DOM we use, which is somewhere. We're going to set the auth server, which is ourselves, 10.0.2.15. Note, there's a lot of static IP addresses here. Really, the auth or CPU servers want their IP address to be fixed. This is maybe an oversight of the Plan 9 implementation. We need an IP net. This IP net is, is some information about the network we reside on. For a more distributed setup, you could have a CPU, file system, auth, etc. floating around somewhere. These all happen to be the same machine, and we'll define them as such. Our IP net is going to be known as home. This could be any name. It is purely cosmetic. We're going to describe our IP range. In this case, we have this IP address, and the range is going to be a dot zero instead of dot 15. I'm going to set the IP mask. And this should be the same as what the DHCP server knows. We need to set our gateway. And this will be the same gateway that the DHCP server informed us of. We can fix our IP address up here in our original tuple by setting the IP equals value. Continuing in the IP net, auth is us. The auth DOM is somewhere. The FS is us. The CPU is us. DNS will note some interesting values were provided above. We can take one of these values and we can use that. We need to import the snarf buffer. And that should be all the information we need in the IPNet table. We'll write that and we're going to quit. Now, we are ready to reboot as an auth server. So I'm going to sync the disk, just in case, because this is a virtual machine, and I don't want to have to rewrite the local file. Now let's reboot. You'll note that Rio was not started here. This is because Rio is not started by the CPU server. So we are now in CPU mode. We can see that one key was read in AES format. That would be Glenda's key. I have connected a host-only adapter to the second 
network interface card on the virtual machine. We can see our IP address for the host only adapter here. This should be routable from DrawTerm. We are going to connect. The host is 192.168.56.102. We'll connect as Glenda. We're going to enter Glenda's password. And we are greeted with a CPU prompt showing a successful connection. We will now start WebFS and we'll start Rio. This is our usual Rio prompt. And now we're going to add a secondary user. We always need KeyFS running when we're modifying users. And we're going to add the user, Hennessy. We're going to first add Hennessy to the file server. And now we're going to add Hennessy to the cron group. Now we're going to add Hennessy to the auth server. We're going to run change user, set Hennessy's password. This is not Glenda's password. And sign a new secret. Post ID is Hennessy. We're going to enable Hennessy just to be safe. And now Hennessy should be accessible. Let's try to drop term as Hennessy. Same address as before. Now we're Hennessy. And we see we are logged in as Hennessy. We now need to run the new user script as we see there's a Hennessy folder, but for Hennessy, there's nothing in the home folder. Such this, such live, such new user, and Rio is started for us. There is no Rio start script for us yet, but we can see we get some default files. At this point, Hennessy is an underprivileged user with access to the cron system. Hennessy can connect from anywhere to the CPU auth server and exists on the file server. Other users could be added, and going forwards, they could be given different permissions, or even host owner could be changed if we really wanted. We just need to remember to update the NVRAM, NDB, and any other relevant systems. To make rebooting a little easier with this specific setup, I am going to add the IP config steps to system start. You can do this through the through a few different ways. I'm going to use slash CFG. We are some host. This needs to be done as Glenda. We are now Glenda. And we can, for the record, have our CP we could have our CPU'd as Glenda, and we can be Hennessy if we want. We need Factotum running. And we see we have a Hennessy shell. We can use Glenda's real start if we want but we're still Hennessy. Going back to Glenda, I believe sys name is our system's name. And we're going to touch CPU start. And this file will be invoked when the CPU starts.
we're going to do pound dash a ip ip config which will do our first network adapter and ip ip config ether slash net slash ether one this will configure our host only adapter Now, if we rebooted the server, the networking setup will be done for us. That's all for right now. This should be a fully functioning server. You can use only one network interface card on, say, a Vulture VM, but for VirtualBox, you probably want one for network access and one for host-only access. There are other configurations available, but it's one of the more straightforward to configure for. Hope it helps.